Hey, I'm Nathaniel Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist, and this channel is dedicated to the archaeology of the Eastern Woodlands region of North America, where I've worked for the last 10 years. Today I want to talk about a couple of sites that I excavated way back in my early fieldwork days uh, in Northwest Arkansas. I got out here in August of 2015, and at the time we were calling these sites the Spring Crete sites, but they've since been renamed. Uh, they're being called the Hudson sites in most of the literature now. We were sent here to excavate because of some highway construction that was going through in the area. And I don't know if the reports that my supervisors wrote for those projects are available to the public, but uh, a summary of that work has been put into a chapter in this book here. It's in chapter 17, and I'll leave a link to that book uh, down in the description of this video. So in reality, the Hudson sites could really be considered one site. There's just a creek that runs through the, the middle of the two of them and they were identified at different times, so they were given different site numbers. That said, there's a significant difference between the geology of the east site and the west site uh, in, in terms of like which side of the creek that they were on. So the eastern site was characterized by much deeper stratigraphy, uh, some of those units going down about two meters deep, and the other side, the west side, was much more shallow, heavily eroded, lots of gravel throughout. I should also mention that uh, the creek runs through uh, what appears to be a sinkhole upstream of the site, which creates a uh, kind of a pool that is useful for people if they want to... Uh, well, it's, it's useful for collecting water or washing material, or uh, it, it also probably attracted uh, useful game animals. So... Uh, a lot of like geologic and geographical utility to this site in general. Um, so the, the Hudson sites are what we call multi-component, which means that they contain material from several different time periods. On the east side, um, where we've got the deep stratigraphy, uh, on top we have this plow zone that was about 25 centimeters thick, and then that's followed by a middle woodland and late archaic period component. Uh, and there we were getting point types like Gary's and Snyder's and King's Corner Notched. And below that, to about 90 centimeters, we had mostly sterile uh, water deposited soil, so not a whole lot of artifacts. And at the bottom of this um, kind of sterile layer, we started to get a uh, what they called a veneer of Middle Archaic Calf Creek Horizon material. and. This is the real meat of the site, and that Calf Creek Horizon goes from about 90 down to about 180, 190 centimeters, uh, so almost two meters deep. There was also a good bit of early archaic material, including uh, jakey and rice-lobed point types, and uh, there's also a Dalton component, which is over 10,500 years old, but these were all out of original context. They had been displaced by erosion. So for this video, I'm going to focus on the Middle Archaic material, since that's the most uh, robust, uh, undisturbed data set from the Hudson sites. The name Calf Creek can mean a couple of different things. Um, Calf Creek, we could be talking on a really narrow level. It's a very specific spear point type. And these are very thin, broad-headed spear points that are thrown with that laddles and they have these deep basal notches that, classically speaking, create a, a square stem with a barb on either side. And uh, this material is generally heat-treated uh, to improve the manufacturing process. It makes it easier to dry flakes off. Uh, and Jack Ray reports that in Missouri, as much as 90% of all Calf Creek points are heat treated and we had similar numbers here at the Hudson sites. They've been found in association with bison kills at other sites and appear to be optimized for bison hunting specifically. We can also talk about the Calf Creek Cluster. So with, this is a range of spear point styles that were made around the same time using similar techniques that includes these like deep basal notching and heat treatment, but often the angles of these basal notches can vary to create diverse base shapes, often with like more flaring or diagonal notch trajectories. So these days we're also starting to talk about a Calf Creek phase or culture, or sometimes horizon, which represents the people who made these types of sphere points, not just the points themselves. And we don't want to confuse a Calf Creek phase with a particular um, like ethnic group 
or language family or tribe or anything like that. This is really just a community of practice, not of identity. This was something that emerged across a really broad geographic range from uh, northeast Missouri down into Texas and then across the, the, the plains. Um, and this happened during a period called the Hypsothermal, which I've talked about in some of my other videos, um, which is a warmer, arid period that lasted for several thousand years. But the Calf Creek seems to emerge right around that like 6,000 year time, uh, time range, which was the onset of a cooler period within the Hypsothermal. And there are several proxies that uh, indicate that this cooler episode was more favorable to bison populations. So the bison uh, population started to expand from the uh, northwest into this region. And as these bison became more numerous, hunting strategies started to reflect that newly abundant resource. All right, so getting back to the Hudson sites specifically, we found a lot, not just the points themselves, but also several cluster features, which I'll talk about in more detail in a minute. But the, uh, so the classic Calf Creek point has a very square stem with deep, straight basal notches. But at Hudson, we saw a really wide range of variation on this theme. So this often included curving notch patterns that created expanding stem shapes and adding a concavity to the base was also a really common trait here. The production of these notches also follows an unusual pattern. If you're not familiar with how stone spear points and arrowheads are made, check out this video over here. It'll, it'll kind of help contextualize this a little bit. And I've got a couple other videos on uh, lithic technology and uh, the kind of flint napping process that's used to make these. So first the notches were punched from the base, which created a crescent shaped flake scar at the end of the notch. And we call this a lunate. But then these notches were widened from the side, which leaves behind a series of parallel flake scars along the side of the stem, which would be especially difficult to do when these barbs were still in place. You can see the difference between a notch with this lateral retouch and one without the lateral retouch on this example, where a practice notch was punched up running through the, the middle of the stem before it was thrown away. And there isn't any lateral expansion on the scars on this practice notch, but you can see the lateral scarring on the sides of the original stem. And this brings me to another interesting artifact type we found several times that we call practice pieces. The manufacture of these basally notched points requires a lot of skill and practice. And we've recovered bifaces like these here, which have been retouched at several angles that make no functional sense in and of themselves, but they do reflect the need to practice this notching technique. And these kinds of notching practice pieces are reported at other Calf Creek sites across the plains and the Ozarks. And they're essentially a diagnostic uh, element of the Calf Creek lithic technological tradition. Another point type uh, found alongside the Calf Creek points is called the Cossetot River. And these are more corner notched than basally notched. And they also have a more bulbous sort of excurvate base, which sometimes has a, a very small notch running up the middle. Nothing like that practice piece that I showed before. Other than that, these tend to be made using similar manufacturing techniques, including uh, deep notching and regular heat treatment and these might represent a more simplified version of the Calf Creek concept or it might also reflect a functionally distinct tool made by people who were trained in the Calf Creek methodologies. I should also talk about the features that we found at these sites archaeologically. A, a feature is a uh, some kind of archaeological material that is destroyed when we excavate it. So for instance storage pits and fire pits aren't the kind of thing that we can like put in a bag and then take back to the lab and then open the bag and it's still in an intact uh, condition. Uh, you actively have to destroy the thing in order to recover it and document it. So a, at Hudson, most of the features were what we call cluster features rather than pit features. So a cluster feature is essentially a group of artifacts that are arranged together in such a way that um, their spatial relationships to each other are an important point of data. We can recover the artifacts themselves, but once we excavate them, that spatial relationship gets destroyed. So when we're excavating, we have to leave them all in place until the entire cluster is exposed, and then we can map and photograph that spatial relationship before we remove the artifacts. 
So a good example of this is feature 18, which is essentially a series of piles of stone refuse that was left behind from the stone tool production process. And this illustrates tool production. Uh, uh, it, illustrates, it illustrates a tool production that wasn't a linear process from picking up a piece of uh, flint or chert and working it directly into a finalized point all in one span. What we're seeing here instead is a production of several early stage biphase preforms that could then be cached in a work area and then they could be finished off later. This method also allows for multiple stages of heat treatment, which makes uh, production easier with a lower failure rate. It's, it's a batch production system. Now, I personally worked on something at this site that I don't think was discussed enough in the report, so I'm gonna talk it out a little bit now. Um, there's the last three levels of unit SS6, and these, uh, these levels were nearly two meters deep. I think they went from 17, yeah, a meter 70 to a meter 90, something like that. Um, and, as we were kind of skim shoveling down in these levels, uh, I started to notice these small but very distinct charcoal pieces. Some of them were about the size of marbles or something like that. Um, and they turned out to be burnt nutshell. And one of these pieces of nutshell actually had a small piece of a chert tool fragment stuck into the shell. It was about the size and shape of a grain of rice. Um, and it was lodged in in such a way that it looked like someone had been using some kind of uh, chert tool to dig out the, the food part of this, uh, probably like hickory nut or something like that. And the, the tool broke on them in the process. Um, one of these nutshells produced a radiocarbon date of about 5,800 calibrated years BP, which is right in that Calf Creek horizon. So Calf Creek culture is really closely associated in the literature with bison hunting, but we don't really tend to think about their use of plant resources too terribly much. But this is a much more direct uh, piece of evidence for the kinds of plant resources that these people were, were using. And several uh, groundstone mast processing tools uh, also indicate that nuts like hickory or acorn were part of a uh, staple food diet here. Speaking of the bison, I haven't really talked about bones at this site at all because there weren't any recovered from these archaic uh, deposits. Uh, and that's because the soil acidity in this region is very, very high and it breaks down bone very quickly. So you really only get bone preservation in this area when you're dealing with sheltered sites, uh, rock overhangs, bluff shelters, caves, that kind of thing. Okay, so to boil this whole thing down to its basics, the Hudson sites represent uh, kind of the eastern fringe of this Calf Creek uh, phase phenomenon. Um, and we see here a much wider range of variation on display than has generally been appreciated in a lot of the literature. We see direct evidence for plant food consumption as well as indirect evidence of some of the hunting practices that were specializing in bison around this time. But some of these points may have been repurposed for smaller game as they got worked down and, and resharpened into much smaller uh, late use life stages. So to conclude, I thought I'd talk a little bit about what it was like to work on this project since I was actually there, and I can talk about that. This was by far the biggest excavation I had been involved with up until this point. Uh, the crew was something like 30 or more people at any given time, like working in, in groups of three. Um, and this job was unusual because there were at least five or six of us who actively practiced the making of stone tools ourselves. Um, and having that many people with so much insight into the manufacture and utilization of lithic technology was, uh, it was an amazing learning experience because anytime we found anything that was worth talking about, we'd all kind of congregate and talk the piece over. And then after work, we would go out to the hotel parking lot and like practice making points ourselves. So I, like, I think I learned more about lithic technology in those five months of excavation and work than I had in the previous three years of field work that I had done up to that point. I got there in August, so it was absolutely brutally hot 
we had at least a dozen of these rickety like walmart brand canopies out to try to like keep our, our body temperatures down and keep us in the shade so the whole area kind of when we showed up would look like this big like tent village full of uh, a bunch of dirty archaeologists i'd say that probably about a third of the people i worked with on that project maybe are still archaeologists in some capacity and i run into them on projects here and there but for the most part most of the other ones have moved on into into different career paths, as is usual within uh, within archaeology. All right, so that's all I've got to say about all that. If you have any questions, you can leave those down in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching.